South Kerry has an immense amount of historical sites. Among these are a large number of megalithic tombs. As might be guessed, these sites are in various states of preservation. Many are still in good condition. Others have been lost. For example, during the construction of what is now the N70, the Ring of Kerry Road, in the mountains near Carter Daniels, some of these are believed to have been dynamited. Fortunately, a large number still survive. Megalithic monuments always attract a considerable degree of curiosity. In particular, stone circles and stone rows perhaps attract the most attention. There are many reasons for this. One is that they are very impressive as monuments. In addition, there seems to be a large degree of fascination with their solar or lunar alignment. However, megalithic tombs also attract attention. Especially large and well-preserved ones, like the iconic Puna Brun portal tomb in Clare. However, others are often overlooked or ignored, even at times swallowed up by gorse and undergrowth. From my point of view, all of these megalithic tombs and constructions are very interesting and have their own special beauty and even magic or mystery. In the spectacular landscape of South Kerry, this mystery and beauty resonates very loudly as does their link with the distant past. Before discussing the wedge tombs in Ivra, it is important to talk a bit about them at a more general level, contextualizing them. This is important as all too often they are seen as just an isolated monument in the landscape, divorced from any social context. There are many different types of megalithic monument. Standing stones, stone rows, circles, etc. In terms of tomb, or what archaeologists regard as a tomb, there are a variety of types. These include passage tombs, summit cairns, court tombs, portal tombs, and wedge tombs. Ireland has a large number of these, but the distribution of each type is various. For example, there are few passage tombs in South Kerry. Wedge tombs are the most common type of megalithic tomb in Ireland. There are around 1,500 megalithic tombs in the country, while wedge tombs account for around one-third of these. The different types of tombs were built at different times, with wedge tombs probably the being the last megalithic construction to be built. It's important to define what a wedge tomb is. Basically, it is a megalithic construction consisting of a large slab of rock called a roof stone or capstone supported by upright slabs referred to as flanking stones. This creates a chamber or gallery underneath the capstone which is enclosed by the flanking stones and lowers and narrows towards the rear creating a wedge shape, hence the name wedge tombs. It's also worth pointing out that they actually were used as tombs though they also performed other functions. Wedge tombs tend to be divided into two basic types. First, simple wedge-shaped box-like constructions, and second, those with long, low galleries. The simple ones consist of a wedge-shaped chamber, though they may also have a small antechamber, and very occasionally a small closed chamber at the rear. The gallery type are more elaborate. In some cases, the galleries can be as long as 14 meters. In addition, this type of wedge tomb is more common in the northern half of Ireland, though occasionally they are found elsewhere, such as La Bacalli in Cork. Roughly speaking, wedge tombs tend to be oriented or aligned towards the west-southwest, or perhaps more generally, towards the horizon and the setting sun. Indeed, according to Osuluan et al., this is a central element of the symbol symbolism. Many wedge tombs had cairns, especially the large ones. These could be round, oval, or even D-shaped. However, in many cases these cairns have been lost, leaving fragments for archaeologists to speculate over. Some also contain cysts or pits containing burials. At times, these cysts were contemporary to the construction of the tomb, other times they were added later. As mentioned, there are 500 wedge tombs in Ireland. However, there is a geographic pattern in their distribution, 
as they tend to be concentrated in the west and southwest of Ireland. 56% of them are in Munster, with the densest concentration being Clare, where there are 145 of them. Southwest Munster, in other words Cork and Kerry, accounts for a similar number, while there is another cluster in Sligo and Mayo, and also in parts of Ulster. Moreover, while in Munster wedge tombs tend to be of the simple type, in the northern half of the country, gallery wedge tombs are more common. Also, generally speaking, wedge tombs tend to date from the end of the megalithic period, from between 2500 BC and 1800 BC. In other words, from the end of the Neolithic and the beginning of the Bronze Age, a period referred to occasionally as the Checolithic. In a way, the Bronze Age brought an end to wedge tombs, and to what can potentially be labelled the megalithic tradition. If we can call a tradition something done in various forms by different groups over hundreds, if not thousands of years. According to Stout and Stout in 2011, wedge tombs died out and were replaced by new types of monuments and ceremony, something important to bear in mind. Another interesting thing is that in around a third of wedge tombs that have been excavated, beaker pottery has been found in them. In other words, traces of that very interesting culture which marked Certain parts of Ireland, Britain, and parts of Western Europe have been discovered in wedge tombs. This raises very interesting questions, especially since beaker people are often said to have replaced the previous Neolithic population and also were more decentralized, meaning that they were less likely to have cooperated on the construction of massive stone monuments. What is the relationship between the beaker people and wedge tombs? It's hard to answer this now but maybe some responses will emerge over the coming years. As mentioned, wedge tombs were tombs used for burials, sometimes single burials, sometimes recurrent. Importantly, they also performed other functions. According to Osulawan et al., they are key to understanding life and death in early Bronze Age Ireland, as they are of practical, symbolic and cultural importance. They can also be seen as monuments. According to Walsh, 1995, they are as much monuments for the living as monuments for the dead. Among the many functions they may have played, in addition to being tombs, include territorial markers, symbolic expressions of belief sim systems, or symbolic authority, access to the supernatural, and repositories for the dead. For example, white quartz has been found in many of them, pointing to some sort of symbolic role. Wedge tombs seem to be related to the development of a farmed landscape in Ireland, and their distribution may be related to areas that represent significant agricultural settlement in the southwest of the country. Several scholars have argued that there is a connection between the siting of megalithic tombs and agricultural land, e.g. Old pre-bog field systems can be found close to them in the burn, but also in Valencia and Kerry. Thus, they seem to be an indicator of the early adoption of agriculture, especially in the west of Ireland. For example, the very high concentration of wedge tombs in the burn could be a response to the increased competition and the subdivision of fields that had been cleared and farmed over a long period. Perhaps they can even be seen as proxy indicators of settlement in late Neolithic or early Bronze Age Ireland. Other scholars have advanced an argument that there is a link between some wedge tombs and the presence of copper mining. There is no space to discuss this here, but it is important to mention it because it shows that these were not isolated constructions. Rather, they always existed in a social context and indeed a social construction. This can be seen in the myths and legends which came to be attached to some of these tombs in the Gaelic period, or indeed, even in the contemporary world. It is now time to turn to the wedge tombs in Ivra. In this region, there are 21 megalithic tombs. Of these, 14 are classified as wedge tombs. The other 7 are unclassifiable, mainly because they are in a bad condition. There are also a small number of other constructions which have no classification, other than being megalithic constructions. I'm now going to discuss three of these tombs, 
Two of them, Cool East and Coolum are wedge tombs, the other Balibrac is classified as a megalithic structure. It may have been a wedge tomb and have been damaged, it is impossible to tell. Coom Wedge Tomb is a particularly impressive structure. It is located a little outside Balneskelligs on a field near the road leading to the Glen and St. Finian's Bay. Like most wedge tombs, it has a large wedge-shaped chamber covered by a large capstone. The latter is 3.2 metres long and is inclined. The main chamber is a little under 3 metres in length, with its width falling from 1.45 metres at the west to just under half a metre at the east. It also has an antechamber. This is described technically as a parallel-sided portico. It consists of two side walls of three slabs, each on the west side of the tomb. This gives it a very impressive appearance. It may also have been roofed originally. In addition, there is a blocking stone between the main chamber and this portico. It's also worth noting that Coombe Wedge Tomb has been excavated. These excavations found the traces of a 12 meter long trapezoidal cairn, narrowing from 12 meters wide at the west to around 2 meters at the east. This was revetted by a row of small upright stones. Furthermore, it appears that the cairn was removed before the growth of the surrounding bog. So the cairn itself may only have been in existence for a short period. Moving on to the next wedge tomb. Cool Wedge Tomb is on a terrace on the slopes of Cool Hill in Valencia. It is a tomb with a view, a great view, as it faces to the Skellix and may actually be roughly aligned with them. It also has a good view of Port McGee Channel and Bailincia, the entrance to Valencia Harbour. It is 3.5 metres long, 2.2 metres wide and between 1.25 metres and 1 metre high. The slab that forms a roof is 3.1 metres by 2.4 metres, quite a big slab. At the front of it are two stones which may have formed a portico or antechamber. It is aligned east-northeast, west-southwest. Stones have also been added to its sides. However, these do not seem to be original. This points to how structures like this can change in use. These may have been added to use the tomb as an animal shelter, or, according to local tradition, it was used as a shelter by an evicted family in the 19th century. It is also worth noting that on the other side of Cool Hill, facing the Blasket Islands, there is a complex pre-bog field system, including walls, corrals, and perhaps even huts, some which could date back to the Bronze Age. Was this associated with the wedge tomb? Ballybrack Dolmen, which is located a little outside Waterfall, is not officially a wedge tomb. Perhaps because it was damaged and collapsed, or perhaps it was meant to be something else. It consists of four large overlying slabs. The top one measures 3.33 metres by 1.88 metres by 0.3 metres, and the other ones are roughly similar. There are also a number of small stones nearby, including quartz, or, as it is officially described, a scatter of small rounded stones. While the Coom and Cool tombs do not really feature in mythology or legend, with the exception of minor folklore, the Ballybrack one is firmly anchored in one of the most significant pieces of Gaelic mythology, the Gaelic origin myth. It is said to be the burial place of Fiel, the wife of one of the Milesians who landed in Balneskelix Bay, which it faces. Although it much predates the arrival of the Gaelic people, this highlights how a tomb like this could serve several functions and that these could change over time. It's also interesting to conjecture a little here. Anthony Murphy has speculated that there could be a link between the arrival of the Beaker people in Ireland and the later Gaelic mythology of the arrival of the Milesians. Considering the link between megalithic wedge tombs and the Beakers, the fact that a megalithic tomb is associated with this event is quite interesting. To finish this video, 
I want to look at something that is only described as a megalithic structure. In other words, the archaeologists are not sure what it is. It's an interesting monument in Kilabunya in the Glen. Like many megalithic structures, it is located on a south-facing slope. It was formed by a regular orthostatic monument and a deep-shaped mount a few meters away. The monument consists of 12 stones enclosing a level area measuring 5.34 meters east-west and just under 3 meters north-south. The stones vary from 0.34 meters and 1.3 meters in height and between 0.68 meters and 0.95 meters in length. It is probable there were originally more stones, as the distribution of the stones that are still there is rather irregular. Overall, it measures 8.7 meters north-south and 9 meters east-west. The D-shaped mound, described as a sod-covered mound of earth, is 6.2 meters north-south and 6.9 meters east-west. It seems to have collapsed or been damaged as little remains of it except for some remnants of stone. There are also some slabs buried beneath the soil. It's hard to know what to make of this place. It's also located near an early Christian site. It faces the Skelligs, like some of the other wedge tombs in the area, and has a great view of the glen itself. What it originally was is a mystery. Could it have been a wedge tomb with a gallery? Or was it something else entirely? We don't know. I can only speculate about it. This is a good way to close the video. There are many megalithic structures around us in Ibra. Some have been classified as wedge tombs, others defy classification. Yet, they are all originally part of a social structure, and indeed, over history, were parts of different social structures. Different peoples and different cultures have interpreted them in a variety of ways. We will never know all of these ways, and we will never know how they were originally used. I think it is important to be aware of our ignorance in this matter, and be content with this. Especially because there are too many people who proclaim absolute knowledge of an uncertain past. At the same time, it is also important to know that these monuments were built by people in the social context for a variety of reasons as monuments, whether to the dead or to the living, or both, as territorial markers, as social spaces or spatials for rituals, or indeed all of these things and many more.